Hello, I'm Robert Miles. Welcome to this recording of the Alignment Newsletter Podcast. This is newsletter number 162, Foundation Models, a Paradigm Shift Within AI, published on the 27th of August, 2021 by Rohan Shah. Highlights. Link, AI Safety Papers, by Ozzy Gowen, summarized by Rohan. AI Safety Papers, announced here, is an app to interactively explore a previously collected database of AI safety work, see Newsletter 130. I believe it contains every article in this newsletter, at least up to a certain date, it doesn't automatically update, along with their summaries, so you may prefer to use that to search past issues of the newsletter instead of the spreadsheet I maintain. Link on the opportunities and risks of foundation models by Rishi Bomasian et al., summarized by Rohan. The history of AI is one of increasing emergence and homogenization. With the introduction of machine learning, we moved from a large proliferation of specialized algorithms that specified how to compute answers to a small number of general algorithms that learned how to compute answers, i.e. the algorithm for computing answers emerged from the learning algorithm. With the introduction of deep learning, we moved from a large proliferation of hand-engineered features for learning algorithms to a small number of architectures that could be pointed at a new domain and discover good features for that domain. Recently, the trend has continued. We've moved from a large proliferation of trained models for different tasks to a few large foundation models, which learn general algorithms useful for solving specific tasks. BERT and GPT-3 are central examples of foundation models in language. Many NLP tasks that previously required different models are now solved using fine-tuned or prompted versions of BERT and or GPT-3. Note that while language is the main example of a domain with foundation models today, we should expect foundation models to be developed in an increasing number of domains over time. The authors call these foundation models to emphasize that 1. They form a fundamental building block for applications, and 2. They are not themselves ready for deployment. They're simply a foundation on which applications can be built. Foundation models have been enabled only recently because they depend on having large scale in order to make use of large unlabeled data sets using self-supervised learning to enable effective transfer to new tasks. To enable effective transfer to new tasks. It's particularly challenging to understand and predict the capabilities exhibited by foundation models because their multitask nature emerges from the large scale training rather than being designed in from the start, and thus is hard to anticipate. This is particularly unsettling because foundation models also lead to significantly increased homogenization, where everyone is using the same few models, and so any new emergent capability or risk is quickly distributed to everyone. The authors argue that academia is uniquely suited to study and understand the risks of foundation models. Foundation models are going to interact with society, both in terms of the data used to create them and the effects on people who use applications built upon them. Thus, analysis of them will need to be interdisciplinary. This is best achieved in academia due to the concentration of people working in the various relevant areas. In addition, market-driven incentives need not align well with societal benefit, whereas the research mission of universities is the production and dissemination of knowledge and creation of global public goods, allowing academia to study directions that would have large societal benefit that might not be prioritized by industry. All of this is just a summary of parts of the introduction to the report. The full report is over 150 pages and goes into detail on capabilities, applications, technologies, including technical risks, and societal implications. I'm not going to summarize it here because it's long and a lot of it isn't relevant to alignment. I'll instead note down particular points that I found interesting. Page 26. Some studies have suggested foundation models in language don't learn linguistic constructions robustly. Even if they use it well once, they may not do so again, especially under distribution shift. In contrast, humans can easily slot in new knowledge into existing linguistic constructions. Page 34. This isn't surprising, but is worth repeating. Many of the capabilities highlighted in the robotics section are very similar to the ones that we focus on in alignment. Task specification, robustness, safety, sample efficiency. Page 42. For tasks involving reasoning, for example mathematical proofs, program synthesis, drug discovery, computer-aided design, neural nets can be used to guide a search through a large space of possibilities. Foundation models could be helpful because 1. 
Since they're very good at generating sequences, you can encode arbitrary actions. For example, in theorem proving, they can use arbitrary instructions in the proof assistant language, rather than being restricted to an existing database of theorems. Two, the heuristics for effective search learned in one domain could transfer well to other domains where data is scarce. And three, they could accept multimodal input. For example, in theorem proving for geometry, a multimodal foundation model could also incorporate information from geometric diagrams. Section 3. A significant portion of the report is spent discussing potential applications of foundation models. This is the most in-depth version of this I've seen. Anyone aiming to forecast the impacts of AI on the real world in the next 5 to 10 years should likely read this section. It's notable to me how nearly all of the applications have an emphasis on robustness and reliability, particularly in truth-telling and logical reasoning. Section 4.3. We've seen a few ways, see newsletter 152 and 155, in which foundation models can be adapted. This section provides a good overview of the various methods that have been proposed in the literature. Note that adaptation is useful not just for specializing to a particular task like summarization, but also for enforcing constraints, handling distributional shifts, and more. Page 92. Foundation models are commonly evaluated by their performance on downstream tasks. One limitation of this evaluation paradigm is that it makes it hard to distinguish between the benefits provided by better training, data, adaptation techniques, architectures, etc. The authors propose a bunch of other evaluation methodologies we could use. Section 4.9. There's a review of AI safety and AI alignment as it relates to foundation models, if you're interested. I suspect there won't be much new for readers of this newsletter. Section 4.10. The section on theory emphasizes studying the pre-training adaptation interface, which seems quite good to me. I especially like the emphasis on the fact that pre-training and adaptation work on different distributions, and so it will be important to make good modeling assumptions about how these distributions are related. Section Technical AI Alignment Subsection Problems Link AI Risk for Epistemic Minimalists by Alex Flint, summarized by Rohin. This post makes a case for working on AI risk using four robust arguments. 1. AI is plausibly impactful because it's the first system that could plausibly have long-term influence or power without using humans as building blocks. 2. The impact is plausibly concerning because, in general, when humans gain power quickly, as they would with AI, that tends to increase existential risk. Three, we haven't already addressed the concern. We haven't executed a considered judgment about the optimal way to roll out AI technology. And four, it seems possible to take actions that decrease the concern simply because there are so many possible actions that we could take. At least some of them should have some useful effect. Rohin's opinion. There's definitely room to quibble with some of these arguments as stated, but I think this sort of argument basically works. Note that it only establishes that it's worth looking into AI risk. To justify the specific things people are doing, especially in AI alignment, you need significantly more specific and detailed arguments. Section Technical Agendas and Prioritization. Link Some Criteria for Sandwiching Projects by Daniel Ziegler summarized by Rohin. This post outlines the pieces needed in order to execute a sandwiching project on aligning narrowly superhuman models from newsletter 141, with the example of answering questions about a text when humans have limited access to that text. Imagine answering questions about a paper where the model can read the full paper, but human labelers can only read the abstract. The required pieces are 1. Aligned metric there needs to be some way of telling whether the project succeeded, i.e. the technique made the narrowly superhuman model more aligned. In the Q&A case, we get the aligned metric by seeing how humans answer when they can read the entire text. 2. A narrowly superhuman model. The model must have the capability to outperform the labelers on the task. In the Q&A case, we get this by artificially restricting the input that the labelers get relative to what the model gets. In other cases, we could use labelers who lack the relevant domain expertise that the model instead knows. 3. Headroom on the aligned metric. Baseline methods, such as training from labeler feedback, should not perform very well, 
so that there's room for a better technique to improve performance. It would be especially nice if making the model larger led to no improvement on the aligned metric. This would mean that we're working in a situation that is primarily an alignment failure. And four, a natural plan of attack. We have some approach for doing better than the baseline. For the Q&A example, we could train one model that selects the most relevant piece of text by training on labelers ratings of relevance, and another model that answers the question given that relevant piece. Rohin's opinion. This seems like a good way to generate good, concrete, empirical projects to work on. It does differ from the original post in placing less of an emphasis on fuzzy tasks where aligned metrics are hard to come by, though it isn't incompatible with it. In a fuzzy task, you probably still want as aligned a metric as you can get in order to measure progress. Section Interpretability Link Automating Auditing An Ambitious Concrete Technical Research Proposal by Evan Hubinger, summarized by Rohin. A core cool worry with inner alignment is that we cannot determine whether a system is deceptive or not just by inspecting its behavior, since it may simply be behaving well for now in order to wait until a more opportune moment to deceive us. In order for interpretability to help with such an issue, we need worst-case interpretability that surfaces all the problems in a model. When we hear worst-case, we should be thinking of adversaries. This post considers the auditing game, in which an attacker introduces a vulnerability in the model to violate some known specification, and the auditor must find and describe the vulnerability given only the modified model, i.e. it does not get to see the original model or what the adversary did. The attacker aims to produce the largest vulnerability that they can get away with, and the auditor aims to describe the vulnerability as completely as possible. Note that both the attacker and the auditor can be humans, potentially assisted by AI tools. This game forms a good benchmark for worst-case interpretability work. While the author is excited about direct progress on this game, i.e. better and better human auditors, he's particularly interested in fully automating the auditors. For example, we could collect a data set of possible attacks and the corresponding desired audit, and fine-tune a large language model on such a data set. Rohin's opinion. I like the auditing game as a framework for constructing benchmarks for worst-case interpretability. You can instantiate a particular benchmark by defining a specific adversary or distribution of adversaries. Automating auditing against a human attacker seems like a good long-term goal, but it seems quite intractable given current capabilities. Section AI Governance. Link What the AI Community Can Learn from Sneezing Ferrets and a Mutant Virus Debate by Jasmine Wang, summarized by Rohin. If you can modify bird flu to be transmitted in ferrets, should your experimental methods be published in full? When this question arose, the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, NSABB, unanimously recommended that key methodological details should not be published. The World Health Organization, WHO, disagreed, calling for full publication in order to enable better science, and arguing that it would be too hard to create a mechanism to grant researchers with a legitimate need access to the redacted information. At this point, many bird flu researchers declared a voluntary moratorium on such research until the controversy settled. Ultimately, the NSABB reversed its position and the paper was published. This post suggests four lessons for the AI community to learn. 1. Third-party institutions like the NSABB can lead to better considered outcomes. In particular, they can counteract publish or perish incentives and provide additional expertise and context. The NSABB had clearance for secret information that researchers could not access. 2. These institutions don't happen by default. The NSABB was only established after the anthrax attacks of 2011, and most other countries don't have an analogous body. 3. However, the powers of such institutions are limited. The NSABB is geographically limited and was not able to create a mechanism for sharing information to only those with legitimate need. And 4. Researchers must take on some responsibility as well. For example, the voluntary moratorium allowed for the development of better policy. Rohin's opinion. The four claims seem quite plausible to me. The Post also argues that this suggests that the AI community should create its own third-party institution, rather than depending on a state-led institution, but I didn't really follow the argument for this, nor do I agree with the conclusion. 
It's plausible that the AI community could create such an institution before some crisis, but states could not, claim two, and that such a community-led institution would be more binding on researchers across different countries, part of claim three. But on the other hand, such institutions seem much worse at binding companies, from which I expect most of the risk, and presumably would have much less context than a state-led institution, claim one. This concludes Alignment Newsletter number 162. For more information, you can go to rohinshah.com slash alignment hyphen newsletter, where you can find all of the previous newsletters and also a spreadsheet of all of the papers and summaries that have ever been featured. Thank you for listening.